we're not in Kansas anymore. To infinity and beyond! Fish are friends, not food. What we've got here is failure to communicate. Bond. James Bond. Hey, Luke. May the force be with you. So we're in this sermon series, and every uh, Sunday we have picked a different movie, sometimes like an iconic movie, sometimes just a movie that has a title that seems to engage with the whole topic of the commandment that we're talking about, which is the case for today, because um, Die Hard is the movie, and I thought, hmm, should we watch a clip from that? No, I don't think so. So no clip from Die Hard uh, today, Um, but we are talking about the fifth commandment, you shall not kill or you shall not murder. And so we're going to jump into that uh, here. Um, But it's really important to to have God's word written on our hearts, in our minds, so that we can take it with us wherever we go. We don't need to necessarily have our Bibles right there with us all the time to be reminded of God's word. And so um, some of you have been through confirmation here at St. Mark's, Confirmation Middle School Ministry, Um, at the risk of being a little cheesy, I'd like to teach you a way that um, we've created to help us remember the Ten Commandments, if that sounds okay to you. And uh, it might be something you can quiz each other on in your family later uh, today over dinner or whatever. So some of you, raise your hand if you've learned this way of uh, the Ten Commandments. Raise it high. It's okay. Be bold. Okay, great. Um, Some of you, actually, at the adult class a couple weeks ago, I taught them too. So here we go. All right, now picture yourself at your favorite sporting event. Um, Your favorite team has just won the championship, and they are number one, right? And so how do they show that they're number one? Yes, just like this, right? So this is going to be a way for us to remember the first commandment, all right, because there is only one God. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me, okay? The first commandment is you shall have no other gods. Will you say that with me? You shall have no other gods. Okay, that, that was sort of very subdued. Should we not bring it up a notch? Thank you, Sarah. All right, you ready? Um, let's say it with a little bit more confidence. You shall have no other gods. If you do this, do number one. All right, let's play along here. Okay, the second commandment, do this with me, um, makes a V, all right? So it'll trigger your mind for vain. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Will you say that with me? Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. All right, the third commandment, actually in sign language, makes a W. This is a W letter. So for worship, it's about worship on Sunday morning. Sabbath, all right? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Will you say that with me? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Okay, the fourth one, this is kind of fun. You make a little, a little salute here, okay? And I'm sorry if you're in the military and I'm doing a really poor job. You should teach me later. Nobody has taken me up on that, by the way, yet this morning, so please be the first. All right, so salute because it's about authority, okay? Honor your father and mother, all right? Can you say that with me? Honor your father and your mother. All right, the fifth one, you're going to use all fingers, but you're going to make it into a shape of a gun. Um, you shall not murder, okay? You should not kill. Will you say that with me? You shall not kill. All right. All right, the sixth commandment. Now, this is one that, um, for some reason, our middle schoolers never have a hard time remembering, okay? And I'll see if you can figure out why. So six um, is a three-letter word. It starts with S, it ends with X, and it has to do with something about adultery. Are you with me? Are you awake yet this morning? Okay. So the sixth commandment is you shall not commit adultery. All right, do you think you can remember that one? And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, that's okay. You can talk about it at home. All right. The, actually, God made it, so it's good to talk about it here too. But anyway, okay, three and four, you're going to make on your fingers for seven, okay? Three plus four equals seven. Um, it is Fourth of July weekend, so in case you're not sure. You can actually swap it. Look at that. I know I've been working on this for years, so that's why I'm so talented. Do this with me. Um, you shall not steal. If you can see one finger goes over to the other hand. You shall not steal, okay? So that's the seventh commandment. The eighth commandment, four fingers on each hand, you shall not what? People who know this, you shall not bear false witness like the claws of a bear, okay? You shall not bear false witness. Say that with me. You shall not bear false witness. All right, my favorite one is nine. Make a little house, and you need a little neighbor, a little guy right there, okay? (laughs) You shall not covet your neighbor's house, okay? Will you say it with me? 
you shall not covet your neighbor's house, okay? And then 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or husband, by the way, um, manservant, maidservant, cattle, which in this case, they only have two, all right? You just got to go with me. Or anything else that belongs to your neighbor, okay? So let's say that together. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or his maidservant or his cattle or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. You learned it. So Ten Commandments, just like that. Let's do a quick review, okay? So the first one, right? You shall have no other gods. Oh, sorry, I'll slow it down. Here we go. You shall have no other gods before me. The second is... You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The third is about worship, all right? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The fourth is honor your father and your mother. The fifth commandment, you shall not kill. The sixth commandment, this is the one that's hard to remember. You shall not commit adultery. The seventh commandment, right? We swap here. You shall not steal. The eighth commandment, four fingers on each side, you shall not bear false witness. The ninth commandment, you and your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. And the tenth commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or his maidservant or his cattle or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Nicely done. Way to go. Give yourselves a hand for that. Yes, it is a lot to remember. And, um, and so I encourage you to practice that today and as you uh, continue to write God's heart, God's word on your heart, all right, to hold it, to carry it with you, and to go with it. So, okay, um, freedom. God's law, the Ten Commandments, um, is intended to bring freedom to us, which um, this is a perfect weekend, right, to be talking about freedom because we're getting ready to celebrate, or maybe I shouldn't say just getting ready. We've been celebrating for like the last couple of weeks, right, at about 10, 15 at night in your neighborhood. Anybody else but me? Lots of fireworks, right? We're celebrating our freedom as a nation, our independence. And um, I do like the fireworks uh, and all, but anyway, that's another topic for another time, right? Um, Freedom. What does it mean to be free? And God's law is given to us for our freedom, for us to experience freedom, not to constrain us, but instead to to allow for us to have life and to have freedom in the midst of our life. The fifth commandment, as an example, if that's a commandment that people hold to, your life is going to be better off, right? Hopefully nobody is going to want to kill you, and you're not going to kill anyone else. Our lives have freedom because of it. There's um, a psalmist. In fact, if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn with me to Psalm 119, because Psalm 119 is such a sweet psalm, and it's really long. You can, you can glance through it, just merely get, glance through it, and grab sentences out of there that show how much the person who wrote it, we'll call him the psalmist, loved about God, what they thought about God, and particularly about God's law. So the psalmist writes about God's word. He, he uses different words to describe it. God's word, God's law, God's commandments, God's ways. And he talks throughout Psalm 119 about how much he treasures the law of God. All right? And I just, I'm just praying that God would give me a greater love for his law than I have right now. So we're going to turn there, and we're going to talk about the law and what it does and how we can have joy and we can have delight in it. So one of the things that the law does is the law gives life. Psalm um, 119 verse 25 says this, My soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. I need your life, life that's given according to your word. Verse 37, Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. What a cool prayer to pray to God. So, uh, So the law gives life, but the law also protects life. The law protects life. Listen to Psalm 119, verse 93. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. You've given me life. So it protects. Um, Martin Luther said this about uh, this commandment, the fifth commandment. He said, we're to fear and love God so that we do not hurt our neighbor in any way, 
but help him in all his physical needs. So as we keep the law, as we meditate on God's law, as we write it on our hearts, it not only gives life, but it protects life. We are more mindful of others, and they're more mindful of us. It protects life. The law promises life. Uh, Listen to verse 49. For I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. For I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. I love that. The law promises life. Verse 72, your instructions are more valuable to me than millions in gold and silver. Wow, I have not thought that on my own. I got to tell you. Do I think about how God's instructions for me are more valuable to me than millions in gold and silver? The law promises life. The law also leads us to life in Jesus. How, how does the law lead us to life in Jesus? Well, the law, while it protects and it promises, it also um, helps me realize that I honestly fall short. It causes me to realize my sin. Um, So for 15 years of my life, from the age of three till I was 18, I took dance lessons. All right, and then in high school and in college, I was on the dance team. So it was a big part of my life. And are there any dancers? I know I sometimes ask that question here. Okay. So a dancer has a best friend and an enemy all in one. And I would say a dancer's enemy and um, friend is the mirror, right? Some of you who have danced, um, mirrors are an important part of a dance studio. They um, are floor to ceiling, right? Often they wrap around the whole room, and they're always there. They're always present. And they're always reflecting back to you what it is you're doing, what you're learning, a new technique that you're honing, um, a new routine that you're trying to lock into your brain and remember. The little things that you want to change and shift and make better so that your performance can be all the stronger. And the mirror is always there. Well, really, God's law is like that mirror. It shows us reality. It might help us see progress like a mirror in a dance studio, but it also reveals our errors, our lack of ability to meet up to the standards of the law. And so when we go through those Ten Commandments, we think about them and we say, yeah, looks like I got some work to do. Well, today you might have heard the Fifth Commandment and you might have thought, like me, you know, of all the commandments, I think that might be the easiest one to keep. Do not murder. Do not kill. But what do you know? Jesus has something to say that might cause you to think a little differently. But first, let's talk about this reality of murder. The deal is that when God created humans, he made them in his image. You can read about it in Genesis. He made them in his image. And so humans, people, are different than all other things that God created. Those things were not created in God's image. And so murder, in particular, is such an, a huge deal because we would be killing someone who is made in God's image. It's a huge thing to take the life of another person because as we do that, we're hurting the image of God. They're formed in the image of God, and we are at the point of diminishing that, taking that away, impacting that in such a way that in really destroying the image of God, okay? So at first glance, we might think it's not a big deal, but, or, or that we can kind of get this figured out, but then Jesus, well, he has something to say about it. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew um, chapter 5. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 21. You have heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. So he's talking about how they've probably heard God's laws from Exodus and Leviticus, as they've grown up, as they've come together in worship, they've heard the Ten Commandments and the laws of God. And, um, and through oral tradition, as God's laws have been passed along through generation to generation, he says, you heard it said that you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. And then there's this really important word in verse 22. Jesus says, but I say, so what's he about to say? You've heard it said. But I say this, I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. 
really? I mean, did he say that? That's, that's me. That's you. We'll be liable to judgment if we're angry with our brother. And I don't have any brothers, so I guess I'm off the hook. Okay, so moving on. I'm just kidding. That's your neighbor, the people around you. Are you guys awake out there? Just wondering. Okay, okay. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever insults his, well, I've done that. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. That's what Jesus says here. Now, he's making this commandment pretty up close and personal all of a sudden. I was thinking I was doing okay until he says that if I'm angry and I insult someone and I hurt them with my words, that I'm liable, I'm responsible, I deserve punishment with the hell of fire. So, he says, um, this is a big deal. I thought murder was just about taking life, but it's diminishing the image of God in any person. It's important, and it's difficult. And I'll tell you what, I'm guilty. And I'm guessing that you are too. Honestly, I'm guilty in the last probably 24 hours, maybe today so far. I don't know about you, but sometimes the, the harshest Arguments can come on their way to church. Have you experienced that before? Where we can be harsh and we can be hurtful in our words. And so um, I want to share with you a video that I think helps put some perspective on the law of God. It's a little longer than we sometimes watch, but I feel like it's helpful for us to gain some greater perspective. Check it out. You're most likely familiar with the Ten Commandments in the Bible, stuff we generally take as good advice. Don't murder, don't steal, honor your parents, the list goes on. And those are just the first ten. There are actually a total of 613 commands, all given to ancient Israel, found in the first five books of the Bible, which in Hebrew are called the Torah. Now the word Torah is usually translated in English as the law, because it has all of these laws in it. And as you read through them, you wonder, Am I supposed to obey some of these, all of these? I mean, what's the purpose of the law? Well, that translation is kind of confusing because while the Torah has laws in it, the book itself is fundamentally a story about how God is creating new kinds of people who are fully able to love God and love others. And when Jesus taught about the Torah, he said that he was bringing that story to its fulfillment. So walk me through the story and how it's fulfilled. So the story begins with God creating humanity who rebels. And God chooses Abraham to bless all of the nations through his family, who end up in slavery down in Egypt, and so God rescues them. Then at Mount Sinai, God makes a covenant with Israel, like an agreement. And all of the laws that Moses gives to Israel are the terms of that agreement. They're like a constitution. And so some of the laws, they're about rituals and customs that set Israel apart from the nations. Other laws are about social justice or morality. And by following these, Israel would show the other nations what God is like. Okay, so the rest of the Torah is just the complete list of laws that Moses gives Israel? Mm, no, the rest of the Torah just continues the story. And the 613 commands are only a selection from that original constitution. And even these have been broken up and placed at strategic points within the story. Now pay attention because you'll see a really clear pattern. Moses gives the first laws to Israel. Yeah, don't worship other gods, don't make idols. And then right after that, there's a story of Israel breaking those very laws. Yeah, they worship the golden calf. And so Moses gives some more laws. And then you get more stories of rebellion. Some more laws, rebellion again, some more laws, more rebellion, and you start to see the point. Right, no matter how many laws, they're just going to continue to rebel. So at the conclusion of the Torah's story, Moses gives this final speech to Israel as they prepare to go into their new home. And he tells them, you guys, I know that you're not going to follow all of God's laws. You've proven to me that you're incapable. And Moses says the problem is that their hearts are hard and that they're going to need new transformed hearts if they're ever going to truly follow God's law. And he was right. I mean, the story goes on to recount Israel's total failure. They go into the land, they break all the laws. Right. Now, the next section of books in the Jewish tradition are the 15 books of the prophets, and they reflect back on the story. For example, Ezekiel, he said that if Israel was ever going to obey the law, God's spirit would have to transform their hard hearts into soft hearts. And Jeremiah said that's when obedience to God's commands wouldn't feel like a duty, but they would be written deep in their hearts. And Isaiah, he promised a future leader, Israel's Messiah, who will lead all of the people in obedience to the law. Now, in Jewish tradition, all of these books together are called the prophets, even the historical books, because they're continuing the story told from the perspective of the prophets. 
Okay, so we have the law and the prophets, and they're telling one connected story about God's desire to bless the whole world through a people, Israel, who it turns out needs a new heart. Yes, and Jesus saw himself as continuing that story. So he agreed with the law and the prophets when he taught that it's out of the human heart that come the most ugly parts of human nature. It's like the default setting of our hearts is opposed to God's law. But Jesus also said that he came to solve that problem and in his words, to fulfill the law. So what does he mean there to fulfill the law? Well, first he said that the demand of all of the laws in the Torah could be fulfilled by what he called the great command, that we are to love God and to love others. So that seems pretty easy. I mean, we all want to love. Well, we think we want to love. But Jesus showed how love is far more demanding than we realize. So he quotes the law, do not murder. And he says, yes, not killing someone is a very loving thing to do. But then he also says that when you treat someone with disrespect or when you nurse resentment against them, you're also violating God's moral ideal because you're not treating that person with love. And so Jesus said true love ought to extend even to our own enemies. So even though this command seems very simple, Jesus showed how our hearts are not currently equipped to fulfill even this basic command of God to love others. And that's kind of a downer. But where Israel failed, Jesus brought this story to its fulfillment. As Israel's Messiah, he fully loved God and others. And he showed all of the nations what God is truly like. He did this through his acts of compassion and mercy and ultimately by loving his enemies even unto death. And after his resurrection, he told his followers that he would send God's spirit to transform their hearts so that they could follow him and fulfill the purpose of the law, to love God and to love their neighbor. So this fulfills the story of the law and the prophets, or in the words of the apostle Paul, the one who loves fulfills the law. The one who loves fulfills the law. Well, that might just be another thing that we should work really hard on, huh? I mean, how's that going for you? I know I might set out for a little while for a short time to love really well, and then I recognize by looking in the mirror of the law that I too fall short in that regard. And so we look to the ultimate one who is the very definition of love to fulfill the law. Let's go back to Matthew 5, and we're going to rewind a little bit to verse 17 and uh, listen what Jesus had to say about this. Do, Do not think that I came that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I think there might be a little different version up here. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus, as the Messiah, came to reinforce the law that God had already written down because God doesn't contradict himself, and God is in Jesus. And so he's clarifying for them what he came for, not to change the law like it's obsolete now, but instead to fulfill it. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. He's talking about the written words of Hebrew that the law was written in. Like, almost like a comma for us, he's basically saying. A small piece, the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Not not even the iota will go away from the law until it's all accomplished. Therefore, Whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, listen to these words, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Seriously? Is that even possible? Jesus' listeners would have been like, what? They're like the professional law keepers, Jesus. How in the world could I be more righteous than that? And that's actually interesting because the Pharisees and the religious leaders at that time felt like they had to keep all of the laws in order to be righteous. They were off in their thinking about that too. But here Jesus' listeners are saying, I need to be more righteous this, more righteous than those religious leaders? That's impossible. It'd be like if you like to play basketball and somebody said to you, yeah, but if you're going to play basketball, you have to be better than a whole team of Michael Jordans. I'd be like, "Um, probably not going to happen. It's impossible. And Jesus knew it as he was saying it because he knows us. And so that's why he said, I'm fulfilling the law. 
It's not up to you to be perfect enough, to be good enough. If you're waiting and you think that God is waiting for you to be good enough to love you, you're going to be waiting a long time. Because the reality is that's Jesus' job on your behalf. That's why Jesus came. That was his whole point in coming, to fulfill the law. At the end of the day, my friends, when we're talking about life and how the law protects and promises and leads us to Jesus, at the end of the day, Jesus saves life. He's a lifesaver. I have a friend this week who um, was in a restaurant and a man was choking and she gave him the Heimlich maneuver and she saved his life. That man needed her that day. He needed her to be there to save his life. You need Jesus. I need Jesus to save my life. I cannot do it on my own, just like that man couldn't do that on his own. We need him. That's why Jesus died on the cross, to save your life, to save humanity. And the law, while it protects and it promises, it leads us to life in Jesus. It it is also where we recognize that Jesus is our righteousness. He saves our lives. Jesus died on the cross to save you. Jesus rose from the dead. He overcame the grave to save you. Allow him to save you. Receive the gift of his sacrifice on your behalf. You know, I I think about, um, and some of you maybe are lifeguards, and you've been trained that somebody who's drowning can actually do what to somebody who's trying to save them? They can actually, in frantic, um, in their frantic behavior, out of fear, they can actually drown the person that's trying to be the lifesaver. Allow Jesus to save you, to save your life. That's what he died for on your behalf. Receive this gift of his sacrifice on your behalf. Be free of the enemy of God's desire to steal and kill and destroy, as John 10.10 says. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. That's an incredible gift that he's poured out for you. And he's not waiting for you to get good enough at these Ten Commandments. He simply loves you as you are right now, not waiting, unabashedly, unconditionally. He loves you. Let's pray. Lord, we are, um, we sometimes uh, get it wrong. We think we need to be a certain way in order to earn your love and It's just so different than what your love is like. Patient and kind. Not keeping a record of wrongs. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross on our behalf. To be our righteousness in your perfection. We just come before you, God, and we just recognize that we do not have it together. No matter how hard we try. We're desperate for you and we thank you for your grace. Thank you for dying on the cross for me, for us, for saving us because of your great love for us. We receive what you've done on our behalf. We ask you to be in charge of our lives. We desperately need you. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray.